Just two and a half weeks into the federal election campaign, and already it's been unprecedented. The announcements keep coming daily, party platforms are unveiled, and of course this will always be remembered as the election when those pictures of Justin Trudeau became public. Aaron Kelly is CEO of Advanced Symbolics, Inc., whose artificial intelligence pollster, Polly, has been scanning what Canadians are talking about this election, and we're pleased to have her back again for an update. Great to see you again. When we were gathered in this very place a week ago, I asked you, how are we going to know whether this blackface scandal has legs or whether it's going to go away? And you said, let's talk mid-next week. Okay, so we're even a little later than mid next week. What's Paulie saying about all this? Well, he's continuing to recover. So the uh, prime minister, the prime minister is recovering. So he was down 25 seats when the story first broke. Um, Paulie saw in 25 ridings, they were going quite negative about it. Now it's he's down 12 from his high point from before blackface. So he's recovered about half of those seats. It's not as fast as I might have thought because you remember when we last spoke. The day after blackface, he'd already recovered five seats. Mm. So now he's recovered an additional seven. So he's still, he's still in minority territory, but about five seats short of a majority at this point. Given how massive that story was when it broke a week and a half ago, it has virtually, I don't want to say disappeared from the media, but you see so few references to it now. Is this story essentially over to the best that you can tell through your polling? Yeah, I think to keep bringing it up, for the other parties to keep bringing it up would be beating a dead horse at this point. I think he is recovering, and I think the slower recovery might be due to a, you know, a mix of issues and not just blackface. Got it. Jugmeet Singh really impressed a lot of people with his initial statements after the blackface scandal broke. Might have been his finest moment in public life, actually. What is the status of the sort of enhanced public opinion that he was enjoying in the immediate aftermath of the blackface scandal? That goodwill, he need, that goodwill is done now, so... Uh, done as in gone? Well, he's up two seats from before blackface, but that's down from having been up nine before. Oh. So it's starting to peter out. Now, he, there's a lot to learn from that. People really liked his authenticity, his, uh, his ethics. People really, really related to him. So it's a good signal for him of what to do more of, I would say. Let me ask you about two demographic groups in particular. Young people and white people who had particularly strong reactions to all of that. Where are they now? They're, I mean, they're still the ones who are reacting the strongest, interestingly enough. So, but again, it's, it's fading as an issue. I don't, we don't feel that this is going to be the big issue for Mr. Trudeau the day of the election. Hmm. The prime minister has always, and his team have always, cared a great deal about getting positive media outside the country. In the U.S., they courted big American media as no prime minister has ever before. How's this all playing out in the States? Oh, he got a big jump in fame in the States. Not for the right reasons, though. <laughs> this was... Blackface actually did get him um, a lot of press time in the press the day that it happened. Of course, in the States, blackface has a much deeper and more malicious history. For sure. People are much more familiar with it than we are here. Hmm. You... Uh, so, uh, just wrapping up this segment of our discussion here, then. Is Pauly prepared to say, categorically, that this scandal, in terms of this election campaign, is essentially done? Not yet, because it is still keeping him in minority territory. So, again, if we talk next week, we'll see, is he continuing to recover? He's still 12 seats down from it. He was in majority territory before this scandal, so we'd like to see him get back there before we could say he's recovered. So this still is having an impact? It's still having an impact. Okay. Uh, next thing, environment. Climate change has been huge, uh, certainly this week in particular with uh, Greta Thunberg testifying at the United Nations. Um, ha has any of that affected people's views on the environment in Canada? You know, it's really interesting. We're seeing a difference between the environment and climate change, which we didn't mm. recognize before. We just saw this this week as we started looking into it, because I mentioned to you last week, uh, climate change is going up and down, which indicates to us it's not a ballot issue. A ballot issue stays steady. It continues to climb. The in climate change is going up and down. So we did a bit of an investigation on that, and we saw that So people on the left who we typically associate with environmental issues do not see climate change as uh, an, an issue of injustice or inequality, which is really what the left is concerned about. You've got a graphic on this. Should we bring this up now? Yeah. You can take us through it. Okay, with this is, and I'll just, just, let me set it up for people listening on podcast. We've got a graph here that's got four bars on it, essentially, and they kind of track 
what people feel across the partisan spectrum on this, from the extreme left to the center left to the center right to the extreme right. And Aaron, just take us through what your findings are on this. So when we look at uh, environment bipartisanship, and of course this is including climate change, what's really interesting is we see people on the far left and the far right less engaged on the environment, including climate change, than people in the center. So this has really become a centrist issue. And because it's a centrist issue, you have to approach it differently as a politician than you would. So you see Elizabeth May right now, she's coming out with a very left-wing um, campaign promises. But this issue is more of a center issue, and therefore it is playing better for liberal conservatives because it's a centrist issue. That is exactly the opposite of what one might expect. You would expect people at the edges to be far more engaged on this one way or another. Why aren't they? Because people on the edges are worried about issues of inequality and justice. So justice on the right, inequality on the left. So the people on the left, when they talk about environment, they're worried about oil spills and save the whales, save the species. People, when they look at climate change, they see this as something that's affecting all of us equally. It is not an injustice issue or an inequality issue. Um, and that's why it's going, it's going up and down a lot. So we saw it go up mostly because of Greta Thunberg being here and the, and the protests. So people are discussing it. But they're discussing it and saying, why can't I get... So people on the, the right, it's, it's an important issue for swing voters, which is interesting. When we took out the people who have already, re already decided and just looked at swing voters, we saw the environment come up in importance. But they're saying, you know, I, I want to vote for climate change, but I don't want higher taxes, mm. universal pharma, all of these things. Why can't I get a party that gives me climate change with fiscal conservatism? But your extreme right number is also pretty small, which suggests to me that Maxime Bernier's attempt to make climate change denial bigger in the country isn't working either. Well, on the extreme right, we see it, is it really Canada's responsibility? You know, this message of we're only responsible for 2%, which is quite significant, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, we, we should be going after China. We should be, you know, which is how can we make China do anything? But it's those kind of messages that we're really not that important. It's an important issue, but we can't affect it. That's... That's the view on that side. How, uh, when we gathered a week ago, you were pointing out that the Greens have sort of, you know, despite a pretty good start, there's no traction out there for them right now. Any changes in that? No. no. That is odd. If the environment is, is so front and center right now, around the world, and even here, why aren't the Greens picking up more support? Because climate change is a very centrist issue, so the people who are concerned about climate change want it to be done in a very fiscally conservative way. Um, and the Green campaign, unlike the Greens in Europe, the Greens here are left of the NDP. So they're alienating those centrist voters who are more likely to go for a liberal or conservative view of climate change than if they go with Elizabeth May, and they do feel she's competent on the question of climate change, but she also comes with a package of universal pharma and free tuition and subsidized daycare. And, so, and they say, well, I don't want that whole package, so I want somebody who's going to in, you know, give me innovation, green tech innovation, and maybe some people are in favor of the carbon tax, some, that, that one's more divisive, but I want that kind of solution and not the whole package on the left. So it's, it's an alienation because this is a centrist issue now. Hmm. On the issue of environmental interest versus energy affordability, as you look at what Polly's picking up in terms of engagement among the 300,000 people yes. that you survey nightly, what are people talking about more? The energy affordability. That's a bigger issue. Yes. Price of gas. Yes. Price of heating their home if they've still got oil. Yes. Affordability generally, yes. But energy mm -hmm. is... And that's... We're seeing that even more in rural locations. So that's interesting. It's not just in the city that people are concerned about that. It's city, rural. It's across the country. Energy, mm -hmm. affordability. Affordability generally, with housing being the top one. Definitely. We talked about that some last week. Mm -hmm. Affordability, cost of living. We hear politicians talking about that every day. What if, if energy affordability, as opposed to environmental integrity and so on, are are what people are picking up on more, what do you think politicians should take away from that nugget of information? That whatever climate change solutions are being proposed, they need to be proposed in a fiscally alert manner. So people are very concerned about cost, the cost of these programs. They want to see programs in there, but they want to see a whole package. How is this going to work? There's been a lot of talk of you know, you can't just tax me on these things. What's the replacement? How am I getting to work? How am I heating my home? So 
there needs it needs to be a whole a wholesome discussion and not just this in isolation and that in isolation. Gotcha. We should do something on the urban rural split as well. Does Polly pick up significant differences between the two? They're not as significant as we would have thought. So we because you asked me this last week, so we said let's go and, and look at the urban rural. The it's funny, they're both very concerned about housing prices for different reasons. The people in the GTA and the big cities are concerned because they're paying for these expensive houses. People in the rural areas are saying, I can't afford to live in those places. So it's I'm being I'm being kept out. And while their costs are more on energy and, and raising children, this is a, a big one too, the cost of family life in rural areas, there's still this feeling that even if I if I wanted to change my career or go somewhere, I'm blocked out from doing that. I have to live in a small town. Hmm. Some of them feel that way. So affordability is an issue across the country in terms of housing, energy. In the in the urban areas, uh, second most biggest area of concern is cell phone bills. So I guess the politicians who are ah, on that okay. are onto something. That explains why we're hearing announcements about how everybody's going to lower our cell phone bills. Yes. That's very much an urban issue, though. Hmm. Um, job creation? Anything picking up on that? Oh, yes. Absolutely. And more job security. So hmm. job security versus job creation. Um, and not so much, it's interesting with if it's the affordability question, it's not so much I want to increase salary. It's more I want the cost of living to come down. So we thought that was interesting too. Wages are not high up, even though it's an affordability issue. But there's this feeling of security, being able to rely on the job that I have. A lot of concerns about the gig economy, for instance, and insecure employment. All right. Um, let's finish up on this. Uh, less than three weeks to go until Election Day. And I know at some point, your artificial intelligence polling system comes to a conclusion about what you think is going to happen on the 21st of October. But you like to have a certain level of certainty before you make that call. Too early still, I presume. It's too early. Uh, what bodes well for Mr. Trudeau is that the Liberals have consistently, since the, the start of this campaign, been in first place, even through blackface. You do know other pollsters have got the Tories in first place by like three points or something. It's close. But he's still hanging on, and that's been consistent for us. First place in the popular vote or total vote, I guess, as we call no, it in Canada, or seat count? Seat count. So okay. that's the difference. Okay, good. We're doing each individual riding. So, and that's, as we saw in the Ontario election, it makes a big difference. Yeah, because actually, because the Conservatives win so many elections in Western Canada by 15 and 20,000 seats, they waste a lot of votes. So the Liberals can get fewer votes and more seats. They have much better uh, seat efficiency than the Conservatives do. And that's another issue, maybe for another for next week, about the geographical divide in the country in terms of issues and votes. That's something, things. right. We should just remind our viewers, make sure you take that into account, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you're leading in the total vote count in the polls doesn't mean you're going to win. Exactly. Because vote efficiency yes. is what was where it's at in a first-past-the-post system. That's right. Phew. OK, I think I almost got that out. <laughs> That's Aaron Kelly from Advanced Symbolics, Inc. Are we going to see you again next week? Absolutely. Awesome. See you then. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.